Well, thank you, Dennis, and good morning, everyone. It's good to be in God's Word, and I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 19, where we shall read today's passage together. I was, or rather, I have been thinking this week. It's been ten and a half months since I had my head injury, and, you know, there's been a lot happening, a lot of things that have not happened medically that should have happened. But one of the things the doctors do, they play with medication, and doctors are very good at that, you know. And some medications work very well and some don't. And all medications have side effects. And one of the things I've been experiencing as they've changed my blood pressure medication in the last week is um, my thinking is a bit more jumbled up. It's a little bit dyslexic. You know, you write out a sentence and when you wrote it, you thought it made sense, but you read it back to yourself and all the words are muddled up. And I th was thinking to myself this week as I was preparing this morning's message, obviously praying that my message would not be dyslexic, but as Christians, it is very easy to become dyslexic in our thinking processes if we are not determined by a very literal, pragmatic, um, sequential reading of God's word, the Bible. It is very easy to get fuzzy thinking, to get fuzzy feelings, and to get confused, and to get the Bible all mumble-jumbled up if we do not take it as God wrote it. And so this morning we are in chapter 19, a pivotal passage of God's word. And I've entitled this morning's message, The Victor Returns to Conquer. And we're going to read verse 11 through to the end of the chapter, and then hopefully you will understand why I've just made the comments I have. And verse 11 reads, Then I, that's John, saw heaven opened, and behold a white horse. The one sitting on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes, sorry, his eyes are like a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood, and the name by which he is called is the word of God. The armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Then I saw an angel standing in the sun, and with a loud voice he called to all the birds that fly directly overhead, Come, gather for the great supper of God, to eat the flesh of kings, the flesh of captains, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and their riders, and the flesh of all men, both free and slave, both small and great. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. And the beast was captured, and with it the false prophet who, is in, who in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped its image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur, and the rest were slain by the sword that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds were gorged with their flesh. Well, if you were to take that passage and just ignore the context, if you were to read that and ignore all the studies that we've done over the past eight months, you could very easily get very fuzzy thinking about what lies ahead for the church and what lies ahead for Christians, indeed what lies ahead for the world. This passage must never be confused with the rapture, the snatching away, the the Rapture and this passage, which refers to the second coming of Christ, are both indisputable events that Christ is going to carry out. And the rapture has been singing about, as Jesus taught in John 14, as taught by Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 and by Paul in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, is the return of Jesus Christ, but he does not touch planet Earth. He comes to the clouds 
and to the clouds only. And he calls us up, the church, up to meet him in the air. And then he takes us back to heaven while on planet earth for a seven-year period, God's judgment upon the world is played out. And as we've been noting over the coming weeks, sorry, the past weeks, you would be forgiven for thinking that that seven years is a cruel, harsh period of judgment if it were not interjected throughout that whole seven-year period by God's mercy through the evangelists. 144,000. You know, it would have been good enough if God dispensed 14 evangelists. Because isn't that what he did in the first century? After Christ ascended, he only dispatched 12 men. And yet he is going to dispatch 144,000 Jewish men as evangelists. As if that's not enough, he's going to dispatch the two witnesses who are going to do great signs as evidence of the authenticity of their message of calling the sinful world to faith in Jesus Christ. And as if that is not enough, God is going to dispatch three great, enormous, mighty angels who will hover above the planet Earth, calling out verbally, shouting at the top of their voices, calling mankind to turn and put faith in Jesus Christ. And so... We come to this passage where at the end of that seven-year period, Jesus says, I'm coming back again. But this time he's going to touch planet Earth, and we'll learn more about that shortly. You see, most of us will remember, I'm sure, as a child, when you were children, the great feeling, the good feeling of what it meant when you discovered you were on the winning team at school on the winning sports team. And I remember well the opposite feeling of how bad, how gutted you felt when you realised you're actually on the losing team. Well, you know, beloved, in Christ we are on the winning team. And if nothing else, we are going to learn this morning, and there's much else, but if nothing else, we're going to learn that Jesus is the victor. He conquers He will never know defeat. In fact, as we're going to learn, he is actually unchallengeable. Today we shall see that King Jesus, when he returns, he will prove once and for all that his absolute sovereign rule exists over everything and everyone who has ever lived and shall ever live. It shall be, as what we've read this morning, shall be fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy in chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, where Daniel said, Behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a son of man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And what we're going to learn this morning from Revelation chapter 19, the last half of it that we've just read, is that the events of chapter 19 must take place in order for Daniel's prophecy in chapter 7 of Daniel to come to its ultimate fulfillment in the kingdom of Jesus Christ, which we're going to begin learning about next week in Revelation chapter 20. Likewise, Job foresaw Israel's Redeemer physically return to the earth, and he said, At the last, he will stand upon the earth. You see, having Jesus come and return in the clouds is one thing, and that's wonderful, but that does not fulfill all those hundreds of prophecies in the Bible that says he shall return and touch planet earth and be an actual, literal, physical king ruling on this planet. The writer of Hebrews explains how from the time that Jesus sat down at the right hand of his Father in heaven, he has been waiting until his enemies should be made a footstool for his feet. That's Hebrews 10 verse 13. The prophet Malachi warned, Who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? Malachi 3 verse 2. You'll recall as a child... The feeling of injustice, and we feel this as adults, 
when the bad guys get away with doing the bad things, well, that day is going to be put right. In Acts chapter 8, verse 33, the apostle there records that even Jesus, when he was here 2,000 years ago, was denied justice. They falsely crucified him. Well, beloved, the text before us today tells us there is a day of justice coming when all the injustices of the past shall be corrected and made right. All the injustices done to the Saviour of mankind shall be reversed and shall be made right by the Saviour that was treated unjustly. In Luke chapter 18, verses 6 to 8, Jesus explains there that justice is coming for God's elect. Now that's significant because we've been learning through the tribulation period, God's elect, the saints of the tribulation, get beheaded for the most part. Most of them are going to lose their lives because they put faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so all the injustices to God's elect people from the Old Testament through the New Testament, through the, the great revival that we've been learning is going to take place during the seven-year tribulation, all those accumulative injustices of God's elect, Jesus says, they are all going to be put right with the coming day of the Lord, which is the coming day of justice. Earlier in Revelation chapter 4, verse 1, John saw a door standing open in heaven. And he was invited to come up here and I will show you what must soon take place. Well, today we see a portal, another portal into heaven opened. But this time it's not for us or for John to see into heaven. It's to let Jesus out of heaven. Here we, in our text, have been introduced to the central most figure of the coming day of the Lord. And it is the rider of a white horse. And as in verse 11, the white horse has one central, pivotal character sitting on it. This is not just any horse. And the rider of this horse is not just a nobody. It is not someone that's a figment of believer's imagination. The events of this Day of the Lord and the rider on this great horse is not just someone who's pretending to be something he is not. Matthew 24 verse 30, it is fulfillment of Jesus' words when he said, he says, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of God, the Son of Man, coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. You can imagine in the day that we are reading about here, the day of the Lord, the world's in turmoil. A great proportion of the world's population has been destroyed. The remnants, the remaining part of the world, for the most part, are focused on venting their hatred and their anger and their indignation against this God who is bringing the judgment. And they are going to be forced through being present and through what left of technology to actually be able to see the events that we are reading about in here, chapter 19, as the rider of this horse, who is Jesus Christ, returns to planet Earth. Now, did you notice as we read our passage from verse 11 onwards that the rider of this horse has various names? Quite fascinating, isn't it? In verse 11, he is called faithful and true. And we should be very thankful he is faithful and true. Have you noticed how there are many things in life that perplexes, perplex us? There are many things in this world that causes mental static. There are many events in our lives and in world events that cause us just to be bewildered. And so therefore, we, it is so necessary for us to have a God who is immutable, who is not only unchanging, but he is immutable. What that means is our God, our Saviour Jesus Christ, is unchangeable. 
Now let's just take that to its divine conclusion. Our saviour, the rider of this horse, is incapable of change. That means he will never even have the capacity to want to be any different than what he already is. Wow. That is so other than us. We are so different to that. Verse 12 of chapter 19 he has on his head many diadems. And diadems is, for the most part, it's a ruler's crown. However, a diadem was also a badge of sovereignty. So on this crown, he is going to have badges that depict and portray and proclaim his absolute sovereign rule. In verse 12, he has a name that's written that no one knows but himself. So obviously we don't know what that name is, but he does have that name. And it's interesting that the name is actually written. So it must be in a unique language with a unique word to express a part of his identity and his character that no human language yet has managed to explore. And identify. In verse 13, he is called the Word of God, and we are very thankful for that. He is the Word of God. And because in our minds, we flip straight back to John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with us, and the Word was God. In verse 16, we read how that this rider of the horse, on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. And it intrigues me that as these events unfold and as this plays out, the people who hate him the most are going to have no option other than to recognise he is who he said he has always been. He is King of kings. He is Lord of lords. And once and for all, for all eternity, the events of Revelation chapter 19 is going to prove indisputably to all in heaven and earth and in hell that he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Now, the rider of this horse, who obviously is Jesus Christ, he has a role to play. And as the text we read spells out very clearly the specific role he is to play in these events. And in verse 11, it says that he comes in righteousness, he judges and makes war. When he returns that second time, he's not coming as the saviour. He's not coming as the peacemaker. He's not coming as Mr. Nice Guy. He's not coming to be patient and merciful. He has been doing that for millennia. And his mercy and his patience has been stretched over the previous seven years of the history of Revelation to an, such an extent that only a holy God could show such mercy. But in chapter 19, on this day, on this day of the Lord, when Jesus returns as King of kings and Lord of lords, the invitation is over. There is no more invitations. Now that in itself is a sad, sad reality for humankind. And God is a God of invitation. Have you noticed that? Right from the Garden of Eden, when Adam and Eve first sinned, he did not snuff out and annihilate Adam and Eve, but he, had, he made for them clothes of animal skins, and he made a way possible to invite them to walk with him. When God snuffed out all of humanity in the great flood and saved only eight people, he invited them to walk in truth and righteousness following the flood. And if nothing else, the gospel of Jesus Christ invites people to come, as we've seen through the evangelistic efforts of the tribulation period, there are many, many, countless number of invitations given to mankind to come and receive forgiveness. And that all stops. No more invitations. 
What a sad silence that will be. In my meditation, I've been thinking, what will it be like for those three angels who have been hovering around the globe, calling out to mankind? What will it be like when they, just preceding chapter 19, when they withdraw back to heaven? I wonder what they will feel. I wonder what they will experience when their mission comes to an end and it will never, ever happen again. They will never be dispatched to call mankind to salvation ever again. Well, Jesus comes in righteousness to judge and to make war. He comes in verse 15 to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron rod. Wow. In verse 15, he comes and he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. Yeah, that's strong language. And the imagery is of the old wine presses, and we are familiar with them. We've seen them in some parts of the world. They still do it. They get a big area, maybe a trough or whatever you want to call it, and they put the grapes in there, and then they hop in and they start stamping on the grapes with their feet. Jesus says, I am coming, and I am going to be the one who stomps out the wrath of God. So when Jesus in the coming verses that we're going to study, as he gives the judgment, as he makes war, as he brings devastation, he is doing what God the Father has designed and intended for his Son to do. When the, sons, when the Father sent the Son the first time, it was to be the Savior of the world. It was to be treated with injustice. When the Father sends the Son Next time, following the rapture, it will be to exercise and to flesh out in very graphic forms the wrath of God. Verse 29, did you notice there that Jesus is going to slay the world's ungodly by the sword that comes from his mouth? Isn't it ironic? The word of God, the word of Christ that we have in our hands, which is so precious, the very word that brings us life is, go, is, to this day, the very word that the world rejects and says is nonsense. And it's going to be that very same word which will bring their final destruction as Jesus speaks out his word for the final time. My friends, we hold in our hands the most precious word that will ever exist in the universe for all eternity, the word of God. It's powerful. Why? Because it comes from a powerful God, a powerful saviour. And so he is no longer the peacemaker between God and humanity, but the worker of justice of God. Now, I don't know if you noticed, but as we read through the passage together, there is only one weapon spoken about. The rider comes with only one weapon, and it was there in verse 15, and it was also reminded to us in chapter 1, verse 16, it's the word of the Lord, that sharp sword which comes out of his mouth, the spoken word which he will use to strike down the nations. Just think about that for a moment before we continue. When Jesus returns, he's going to exercise the same power he exercised when he created the world when he created the universe. Hebrews 1 tells us that God created all that exists through the sun. Now that takes a lot of power. Just think about it for a moment. In between the different things that Christ created in the universe, the stars, the sun, the moon, the planet Earth, in the popping out of the land of the waters, in the creation of animals and plant life and all their complexity, at no point did he have to sit down and just have a rest because he got but tuck it out. He didn't have to stop for smoko. He didn't have to go and get some help from angels because he was getting a bit tired. He didn't have to stop and say, look, I'm just running out of some my creative juices are just running a bit slow. I need some help. He didn't, did he? His infinite mind with his infinite capacity for creativity and inspiration just flowed naturally without hinder. That same creative power and intellect is what is going to be 
used and employed in this day of the Lord as he works out his justice on a world that hates him. The world is no longer denying him. The world at the present, as we know it today, in the year 2019, lives in a luxurious condition where God permits them the luxury to think there is no God. That won't happen. By the time the world gets to the end of the revelation, sorry, the end of the tribulation, and we come to Revelation chapter 19, there will not be a single person on planet Earth that thinks there is no God. There will be no pretend atheist, and I say pretend because I am utterly convinced there is not a human being that exists now or has ever existed that truly does not believe there is a God. I can say in my 56 years of living, every so-called atheist I've spoken to believes there is a God. And they have convinced me that there is a God by all the atheists I've been talked to in my life. But when we get to this point in humans, human history, there will be no claiming atheists. All the people that are still alive are going to be focused on hating God and cursing the God who's bringing judgment on them. Now, the writer has some clothing, very interesting clothing. Did you notice in verse 13? He's clothed in a robe dipped in blood. That's a pretty graphic scene, don't you think? And the question arises, why is the rider's robe blood red when the battle has not yet taken place? Good question. And the answer is very simply this. This is not his first battle. He's been, oh mind you, I better add before I carry on. It's not his first, but it will be his last. He will never go and fight again after this day, after the day of the Lord. He's been fighting for his people for millennia, including the bloody victory he won at the cross of Calvary. If anyone is entitled to have his clothes splattered with blood, it is the Lord Jesus Christ. From back in Old Testament days when he has been defending his people right through his own injustices on the cross of Calvary, right through the New Testament times as he is, and including our own time, as he's de- Fended people as he's taken those people who have been martyred. And think of that. All the Christians who have been put to death simply because they, they have faith in Jesus Christ, their blood is all representative in his own gowns, in his own clothing when he returns to put justice right once and for all. And so shortly the blood stains shall actually increase. He will tread the wine press of the fury of the wrath of God. You know one of the things that happens, and I watched a little video clip, when they, when they stomp on the big, the, the tub, the big tub of uh, grapes to make wine to get the juice out, you know what happens to the juice? A lot of it splatters up, it splashes. And so the people who actually do the stomping get covered in grape juice. And the harder they stomp, the more vigorously they do their work, the more the evidence shows on their bodies from the splashes of grape juice. And here Jesus comes and the language is deliberately written to cause us to have a picture in our minds as he stamps out the wrath of God on a hateful world, he is going to be splattered with their blood. A terrible, terrible picture that is intended to form a graphic image in your mind of the horrific nature of what is coming on this day of the Lord. As I was reading this passage, as I have read it many times over the past few months, I have been impressed with the fact, or rather it has impressed upon my thinking, that this is not a static picture. What we've read here in Revelation 19 is not some snapshot photo that John took and he saw a static picture of Jesus on a horse and nothing's moving, nothing's happening. This is a graphic, live image of events that unfold in the day that is coming. 
John affirms this in verse 14 when he said, And the armies of heaven were following him on white horses. And so not only is Jesus involved, he has a whole army with him. And did you notice in verse 14, he uses the word armies in plural, the armies of heaven. And so what should be going through your mind is, who are these armies? Who are the people in these armies? Well, first of all, as from verses 7 to 8 of chapter 19, which we looked at last week, it's Christ's bride. That's us, the New Testament believers that have been raptured up, who just immediately preceding the return of Christ in chapter 19, we are engaged in the marriage ceremony to Christ. And so the bride is made up and she's granted to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. There will be the tribulation saints, as we learned about from chapter 7, verse 9. All those people who were murdered during the tribulation period because they came and put faith in Jesus Christ, they will be there. There's the Old Testament saints. And you could read Ezekiel 37, verses 12 to 14, and Daniel 12, verses 1 to 2, and where the Old Testament saints will be there alive and healthy and well, presented clean and pure. There will be angels, as we've been told about in Matthew 25, verse 31, where Jesus said, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. You see, the man in me just can't help thinking, what would it be like to be in heaven the day before this happens? Can you imagine the anticipation can you imagine the angels talking? It's going to happen. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. As they build up, as they prepare to fly out of heaven with their king, with the saints, with the washed ones, with all the people who have put faith in God through all the millennia, Old Testament and New Testament, as collectively they say, come on people, you go with the Lord and we will be there with you. The anticipation will just be absolutely enormous. So, it should be noted in all the armies that launch out of heaven, not one person had any weapons. Isn't that intriguing? Only the rider of the horse, Jesus Christ, had a weapon, and it was the spoken word of his mouth. Huh. And you're thinking, well, what sort of battle is that going to produce? You're setting yourself up for disaster. Are you on a suicide mission? You know? Well, let's see how the event that Revelation 19 unfolds, how it plays out, how this day of the Lord plays out. And so pivotal to this whole event is verse 19 that we read. And John says, I saw the beast and the kings of the earth with their armies gathered to make war against him who was sitting on the horse and against his army. So the kings of the world have gathered. They've gathered to a place that we know from last week and the week before, a place called Armageddon. And they've come to make war. That is their intent. They do want to stamp out Israel. They do want to annihilate Israel. That's true. And that is on their agenda, but primarily their sole focus really is determined. They have gathered to fight Jesus. Now, that means they know he's coming back. Isn't that interesting? They don't pull all their worldly resources together to go and fight someone that they know is not going to turn up to do battle. So they know he's coming. And they know the armies of heaven are going to be with him because it's stated there. And so they gather with the purpose of doing war, final, once and for all. They are determined that they are going to conquer this Jesus and all those saints that are with him. That is their determination. Now, look at it in verse, just drop your eyes again to verse 14 and just, just glance at it. This, this judgment... Sorry, chapter 16. If you're in your papers, just flick back to chapter 16, verse 14. This event actually started back in chapter 16 with bowl judgment number 6. Not 7, but the second to last bowl judgment. 
And they, that's the world's leaders, they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the world. Sorry, I'll just clarify my statement there. Heaven, sorry, hell has opened up and has administered powerful demons to go into the world to gather and persuade the world's leaders to combine their military resources to go and fight God. And so they are demonic spirits as performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Verse 16. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. And so right back in chapter 16, we see that the world's hatred, inspired by demon powers, has caused them and all their armies to come and meet in one place, one geographical location for one purpose, and that's to do battle in the place that we know as Armageddon. However, they have to wait. <laughs> because the one they've come to make war against hasn't arrived yet. Bit of a problem that, don't you think? Hmm. It turns out that they're not as in control as they thought they were. And it turns out that the demons who motivated them to go and make war are not as in control as they pretended to be either. Jesus is in control. And so they gather to make war and they get to the place of Armageddon and we're going to do it. Who are we going to do it with? Ugh. Okay, guys, let's just, let's just sit back and wait. He'll turn up eventually, but they know he will turn up. <laughs> Praise God, he does. So, how does it play out? It's like this. While they are waiting at Armageddon for their enemy to arrive, God pours out bold judgment number seven. Ha! So here they are. Picture it in your mind. This enormous army, hundreds of millions of soldiers with the entire world's military resources combined in this one valley, which is 300 kilometers long, which is the length of Israel. And there's, the nerve center of that military campaign is in the valley of Armageddon. And while they're waiting for their enemy to turn up, God pours out bowl number seven. Now look at bowl number seven in your Bibles, chapter 16, verse 17. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out for heaven from the throne saying, it is done. And they're sitting in the valley of Armageddon. It's not happening. It's not done. But God says it's done. And here's why. Just read verse 18. The storm that ends all storms. There were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on earth. So great was that earthquake. Verse 19, the great city, that's the Babylon, the great we studied last week, was split into three parts and the cities of the nations fell. And it continues in verse 20 to 21. And every island fled away, and no mountains were to be found. And great hailstones, about a hundred pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they responded how? They cursed God. And so when we come to chapter 19, we come to verse 17, then an angel standing in the sun. In other words, he wasn't standing in the planet sun. He was standing in the view in the sight. Another one is great angels standing up in the outer, outer atmosphere. And he's standing in the sun and with a loud voice he calls to all the birds that are flying directly overhead, come, gather for the great supper of God. You see, the battle of Armageddon hasn't happened yet. They're in the valley waiting for Christ to return so they can fight him. While they're waiting, God sends these huge earthquake like never seen before, these great 100-pound, what's that, 30-odd, 34-kilogram hailstones that would have fallen on the millions of military people waiting to do battle with Jesus Christ. Their army would have been not obliterated, but would have been pretty well decimated before Christ even turns up. Just with the natural events that Christ 
causes to occur in bold judgment number seven. And what's more, this angel appears in the sky and they would have been witness to this great angel calling all the birds together to do the cleanup job. The vultures. These vultures were also referred to in Matthew 24 verse 28 and Luke 17 verse 37. And the angels invites the birds to do the cleanup job for the, before the battle even takes place. Now, if you were a soldier waiting in the Valley of Armageddon to do a battle with an enemy that hasn't arrived yet and these horrific, what they will think, natural events such as earthquake and hail, etc., take place, they, it is so severe the mountains are made low that every city in the planet is flattened you would be thinking, we're in trouble, people. We haven't even started to fight yet, and we are in trouble. So how did they respond? You see, if it was me, I'd say, God, help thee, help me, help me, help me. I am so wrong for being here, God. Change me, help me. But that's not their response. Why? The evangelism period of grace is over. And so they curse God, which is an acknowledgement that they understand why they are there in the Valley of Armageddon and they understand why these bowl number seven judgment has happened. Ezekiel spoke about this also in Ezekiel 39, verse 17 to 20, which I won't take the time to read. Now, so I hope that paints a little bit of a picture in your mind what's happened, where the world is at, it's in suspense, waiting to fight this Jesus and we come to Revelation 19 verse 11 and then John says heaven opened ha <laughs> ha heaven opened the world's waiting what's left of its military power is all focused on the sky and they're waiting and heaven opens and behold a white horse well you see the world's lined up with all its bazookas its Tanks, it's guns, it's, it's fizzbang guns, it's lasers and everything we can pull together. And God turns up on a white horse. Ha! You see the irony of it? The world's got it all together. We're going to fix this Jesus once and for all. And he doesn't even come prepared for war. He comes riding a white horse. I mean, what do you do? You see the irony of it all. Such is the power of Jesus Christ. Such is the inevitability of the victory that is awaiting him. And he doesn't even bring a sword. He doesn't bring a shield. He doesn't bring anything. Why? Because he's got the greatest weapon of all, the word of his mouth. And the world has nothing to answer for that. And so he comes this white horse rockets into the atmosphere, followed by the armies of heaven as well, riding horses. <laughs> They're gathered there to make war. And look at verse 15 of chapter 19. And from his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations, and he will rule them with an iron rod of iron. And he will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. My friend, if you are listening to this, and you have been deluded and lied to by the world, if you have allowed yourself to be deceived by Satan to thinking that this is not real, listen up. As I have had to listen up. And as the other people here have had to listen up. God is giving you information that you must listen to if you ever want to escape being involved in this day. This is inevitable. It's irreversible. It's undeniable. It is pre-written in the future history of divine almighty Yahweh. This will happen. Don't delude yourself into thinking because big brother, the next door neighbor, cousin bro down the road, oh, cheer bro, it's all good, it's okay. 
Don't think that that is going to change the inevitability of Jesus' return to conquer his enemies and to bring sin to an end. It won't. Don't be deluded in thinking that you'll stand there wondering, oh, Jesus, I don't believe this. And it's all going to disappear and go away. Because it won't. We mock God with our silly thinking, with our cheap words, and with our arrogance, and says, God, because I don't accept what you say, it's not going to happen. That is the lie of Satan from the pit of hell. Don't allow yourself to be suckered into it. If you have people you like, you love, and care for who are feeding you that lie, change your friends. Because they are happy to lead you to hell just as they are going to hell. Believe the word of God. God has never been proven wrong. He shall never be proven wrong because he is incapable of being wrong. But unlike you and I, we are wrong all the time. (laughs) Well done, people. But isn't that the truth of it? And you're looking at a man that was not walking to hell. I was sprinting to hell. And Jesus rescued me. Why? Because he brought people into my life who had the guts, the courage, and the love to tell me what the word of God actually says. And they called me to repentance. They called me to be sorrowful over my sin. And then God gave me the faith. He gave me the ability That's all it means. He gave me the ability to say, I believe, I repent. I put God's word before man's word. I choose Jesus over hell. I choose Jesus over self. I choose Jesus over sinful pleasures. And so the imagery of Revelation chapter 19 is graphic. As Jesus returns and meets his enemies eye to eye, He stomps out the wrath of God and he brings justice and he does it by simply the word of his mouth and all the millions of army people gathered in Armageddon to fight him are snuffed out and consumed and die in an instant by nothing more than the spoken word of the rider of this horse who enters into earth's atmosphere with the armies behind him. Revelation 14, verse 20, speaking of this event, says, And the winepress was trodden outside the city, and the blood flowed from the winepress as high as a horse's bridle for 1,600 stadia. That's 300 kilometers long, as high as the horse's bridle. That's a lot of blood. And it's intended to paint a horrific, ugly, painful picture in your mind, my friend. The vast number of dead bodies to fill a valley 300 kilometers long up to the horse's bridle is immense. The stench, the filth of it all. Not one of those people who came to Armageddon to fight God had a chance to fight the last memory they will have is looking up and seeing the rider on the horse coming through the clouds. Poof. That's their last memory. Don't cheapen the word of God by saying, it'll never happen to me. Yes, it will. It will. And so he calls you today, as he does in the future, to come and receive forgiveness to die to yourself and to your own misguided unbelief as all the people here have had to do to find peace with God. Hey, out of all this devastation, there's some good stuff coming. So the armies that came to fight Christ are obliterated. God has already set up this enormous network of vultures and birds and wild animals to do the clean-up job of all the dead bodies. 
Antichrist, did you notice that in verse 20 of chapter 19? Antichrist is captured and the beast was captured and with it the false prophet who was in its presence had done the signs by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. These were thrown live into the lake of fire that burns with sulfur. It's interesting. These weren't present in the valley of Armageddon when the battle took place. Cowards. To use the Kiwi vernacular, gutless cowards. They managed to muster up all the armies of the world to come and fight Jesus in the name, not for us, we're out of here. And they went and hid somewhere else while they watched their armies being decimated just simply by the spoken word of the returning, conquering King Jesus. However, God grabs them. He sends out his angels and they grab these two and they throw them. They don't ever die. They just throw them live into the lake of fire. Did you notice there there's no right of appeal? It's not like our modern justice system where once the sentence is passed, you can challenge the judge and say, oh, I disagree, judge. I appeal. There'll be none of that. There'll be no rights. There'll be no civil rights being violated here because it will be justice. And justice will be swift and it will be irreversible. There will be no negotiation. There will be none of this business, oh, you can't do that to me, God, because I didn't believe. And God says, but hang on. I've been telling you for thousands of years what you should believe. I even sent a comprehensive written instruction manual to assist you so you would know what to believe. And not only that, I sent you over the years millions upon millions of my people to assist you in the practical nature of what it means to hear the word of God and to come and put faith in Jesus Christ and if that's not enough I even sent the Holy Spirit to bring conviction and to give you the intellectual ability to reason through the gospel so that you knew what you were to do or at least so that you knew what you were rejecting there will be no right of appeal on this day No unbeliever will escape this justice, as in chapter 19, verse 21 of Revelation, and the rest, that's the rest of the unbelieving world, were slain by the word that came from the mouth of him who was sitting on the horse, and all the birds gorged with their flesh. Wow. And, you know, the word, it's it's a graphic, horrific picture. The The word for gorging means they ate so they could eat no more. Having grown up a farm, I know dogs are like that. Dogs will eat until they're full. So full they don't have to swallow anymore because the full is up there. They will then turn and vomit and they will go back and eat more. That's what a dog's like. And that's the picture of this gorging here. The, the, the vastness of the mortal fatality is so huge that these, the wild animals and the birds are just going to gorge themselves until they are full. No one will escape. It's at this time, Matthew 25 comes into play in verse 31 to 32, which says, Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate the people one from another as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. It's on this day when Jesus Christ will send out his angels, as according to Matthew 24, verse 31, and the angels will go around the the remaining people in the planet and pull them all together and separate those who have believed in Jesus Christ who have not been martyred for their faith from those who have rejected Jesus Christ and were in support of the army that went to fight against him at Armageddon. Christ at this time also restores Jerusalem and Israel. And this is a fantastic picture. This is the beginning, the initial transitional period between the day of the Lord and the coming kingdom. And we're not going to spend time today, but we've got the next two Sundays, we're going to consider the transition from the day of the Lord, which we thought briefly about today, into the 1,000 years of literal kingdom, which chapter 20 talks about. And there's a bunch of things that take place. And there is actually, in biblical history, a 75-day period that fits right in the, the white gap. 
You know I like those white gaps in Scripture. They appear from place to place, and they've got some significant events that take place. Well, you notice in your Bible there's a white gap between chapter 19 and chapter 20. Right in there is a 75-day period, which we'll talk about next week, which the prophet Ezekiel and Daniel spoke to, what happens there. A part of that is the clean-up job. In fact, Ezekiel 39, verse 11 to 13, describes that there is going to take um, seven months to clean up all the dead bodies from the Battle of Armageddon. That's a pretty comprehensive clean-up job. So, Israel will be restored. Zechariah foresaw this, and on that day, Zechariah prophesied, his, Jesus' feet, shall stand on the Mount of Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east. And Ezekiel 39.22 says, The house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. Israel will never disbelieve Jesus ever again. Israel will never reject him ever again. Israel will never say we have no Messiah. They, Israel will never say that the, the Messiah is not coming. Isaiah, sorry, Israel shall return to Jesus. They shall turn to him as Zechariah prophesied in chapter 12, verses 10, right through into chapter 13. And I'll just give you a quick reading of parts of it. And the Lord says, And I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. Notice where their ability to call for mercy comes from. God gives it to them in the first place. So that when they look on him, and upon Messiah, upon this returning Jesus, on him who they have pierced, and him who they crucified, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. And on that day, on the day of the Lord, we've been reading about in chapter 19 of Revelation, on that day, the mourning in Israel will be as great as the mourning for Hadad Rumen in the plain of Megiddo, that's in the plain of Armageddon. And the land shall mourn each family by itself. On that day there shall be a fountain opened for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. And this will fulfill Paul's prophecy in Romans 11 verse 26. In this way all... Paul says, all Israel will be saved as it's written. The deliverer will come from Zion and he will banish ungodliness from Jacob. The battle of Armageddon takes place. Much of the Israelite population around the world will actually be destroyed through the uh, tribulation period. But remember earlier, God had taken a one third of the nation and hidden them out in the desert where they are safe and protected. They will come out of hiding on this day. They will look at the destroyed world and they will look at Jesus victorious on his horse who by this time has landed on his feet and has touched planet earth and he is standing on the Mount of Olives and they will turn to him and they will weep with sorrow because they will realise how wrong they have been. They will turn and mourn and say, we believe, we surrender, we give ourselves to you. Well, I don't know if I've gone over time because I've got no clock today. So it's probably appropriate that I stop there and we will pick up next week in chapter 20 and how these events continue to unfold and we'll try and fill in some of the other white gaps that I've overlooked today. And so we, I look forward to much excitement. Now, here's the thing before I close in prayer. Beloved, if you believe Revelation chapter 19 is literal... You are morally and ethically bound to accept Revelation 20 as being literal also. If there is even a single molecule of biblical ethics within you, you have no choice but to accept that the literal word of the literal Messiah in Revelation 19 is the same literal word of the same literal Messiah that is going to establish his literal kingdom in Revelation 20. Father, 
by your Holy Spirit, impress the seriousness of these truths upon our minds and upon our hearts. And Lord, if there's anyone listening to this message, be they here or on the internet in the future, if there's anyone listening who has got a proud heart that is fighting you and resisting you, I pray that by your Holy Spirit you turn up the volume of the conviction in their hearts so it is so loud that they will realise there is no hope for them other than total surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ in their lives. Oh, be glorified in our lives, we pray as we long for and look forward to the return of Jesus Christ to set right all the injustice that, is, injustice that has ever happened when he will establish his kingdom and indeed rule as Lord of Lords and King of Kings. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen.